VOA won the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Jill Robbins and I tell you about a recent opinion story in an American newspaper. Later, Jill Robbins answers a question from an English learner in China. We close with an American story. This week, it is Quiche by Jack London. But first... The next First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden, holds a doctorate in education. She completed her degree from the University of Delaware in 2007. When President-elect Joe Biden takes office next month, Jill Biden will be the first ever First Lady with a doctoral degree. She is widely known as Dr. Jill Biden. This is not unusual. In English, the word doctor can appear before the name of a person who holds a doctoral degree or a medical degree. But a recent opinion article published in the Wall Street Journal newspaper disagreed with the custom. The title of the article, by American writer Joseph Epstein, is, Is there a doctor in the White House? Not if you need an M.D. M.D. is short for a doctor of medicine. Epstein begins his article like this. Madam First Lady, Mrs. Biden, Jill, Kiddo, a bit of advice on what may seem like a small, but I think is not an unimportant matter. Any chance you might drop the doctor before your name? Epstein argues that Jill Biden does not deserve to be called Dr. Biden because she is not a medical doctor. He notes, A wise man once said that no one should call himself doctor unless he has delivered a child. Reaction to the article came quickly. Supporters of Epstein's argument agreed that people with teaching degrees should not want people to call them doctor. One conservative television presenter, Tucker Carlson, said Dr. Biden is as much of a doctor as Dr. Pepper is. Dr. Pepper is a popular brand of soft drink. Critics of Epstein's article, however, expressed surprise that the Wall Street Journal let such a story be published. They said, they found it to be offensive, sexist, and, more simply, pointless. In a post on Instagram, former First Lady Michelle Obama wrote, Right now, we are all seeing what happens to so many professional women, whether their titles are Dr., Ms., Mrs., or even First Lady. All too often, our accomplishments are met with skepticism, even derision. Another former First Lady, Hillary Clinton, used fewer words. She tweeted, Her name is Dr. Jill Biden. Get used to it. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris reacted to the article during a television appearance this week, saying, it's not the American way. Jill Biden offered her own response Thursday, when she and President-elect Biden appeared on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. She said the Epstein article surprised her. She said her doctoral degree is one of the things that she is most proud of. She added, 
I worked so hard for it. Around the world, social media users who hold doctoral degrees in fields such as history, education, and mathematics changed their Twitter names to include doctor. In professional situations, it is correct to use the title doctor for medical doctors as well as for people who have earned doctoral degrees. The lowercase form of the word doctor is only used to describe a person who is trained and licensed to treat sick and injured people. Jill Biden's students called her Dr. B. At political events, she is introduced as Dr. Jill Biden. Her Twitter account is at Dr. Biden. The general belief is that anyone who has earned a doctoral degree has the right to have the honorific doctor before their name. But what about in other languages? Many are similar to English. In Spanish, for example, doctor is used for people with medical degrees and doctoral degrees in other fields. Claudia Bautista, a VOA Learning English listener from Mexico City, explains. In my city, the governor-in-chief is Doctora Claudia Scheinbaum. All people, colleagues, news, call her Doctora Scheinbaum. She is a politician, activist, writer, and scientist with a doctoral degree. That's why we call her Doctor or Doctora. In Spanish, the feminine form of Doctor is Doctora. It is much the same in Turkish, as VOA Learning English listener Cem Utkan explains. Doctor is placed before the names of people who have completed their doctorate education and have the title of doctor, Utkan said. The same word is also used for medical doctors. Some languages, such as Vietnamese and Chinese, use different honorifics for the two kinds of doctors. San Dao, a listener from Vietnam whose second language is English, explains. Vietnamese uses Bac Si, doctor, to address medical doctors who work in hospitals, dentists, or maybe veterinarians or physicians. But one point worth saying is that Bac Si is not an honorific for those who have completed their PhD. A PhD holder is called Dien Si, which can be clearly distinguished from Bac Si. Sen adds, I believe everyone knows the next first lady is not a medical doctor, so there's no point in clarifying it. As Epstein's opinion article and reaction to it went viral, the American dictionary Merriam-Webster offered a bit of language history. It wrote on Twitter, the word doctor comes from the Latin word for teacher. You probably already know that VOA Learning English has a Dr. Jill of its own. That would be language learning specialist Jill Robbins, who earned a doctorate in applied linguistics from Georgetown University. Around the office, when we are there, many of us call her Dr. Jill. Yet it is VOA's own writing style, and the writing style of most American news organizations, to only use doctor before someone's name if they are a medical doctor. That is why we call the nation's top infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci, but do not use the honorific doctor when writing about Jill Biden. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Jill Robbins.
To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. Next up is this week's Ask a Teacher. Today, we answer a question from Ryan in China. He writes, When I want to say no with more politeness, what are other expressions I can use? Here are some examples about the situation. When the teacher asks me, Do you have any questions? Or when the flight attendant asks me, do you need coffee? Thanks, Ryan. Dear Ryan, thank you for your question. Most Americans speak directly and are not afraid to say no in many situations. But we do have ways to be polite or show respect for another's feelings. The simplest way to be polite is to say no thank you. Let us look at some other polite ways to say no. In the case of a teacher asking, Do you have any questions? You may want to answer this way. No, I do not have any because your lesson was very clear. Another answer you may give is, Not now, but I might have some later when I try to do the assignment. This leaves open the possibility of asking questions on the subject later. On a plane, when a flight attendant asks, Do you need coffee? You may hear this answer. Thanks, I'm fine. Note that the speaker does not use the word no, but still sends the message that coffee is not wanted. Another answer would suggest something else the attendant can bring. No thanks, but I would like some water. I think that saying no may be more difficult in other situations, such as when a friend asks you for a favor. In this case, Americans would usually explain why they cannot help. Here is an example. Ryan, can I borrow your bicycle tomorrow? No, I'm sorry, but I need it to go to my job. It is also difficult to say no to an invitation. We might say we would like to accept it, to be polite. Listen to this example. Ryan, can you join us for dinner Saturday? I wish I could, but I have other plans. Here, you express the idea that you want to accept the invitation, but you do not need to give details of your plan. I hope this helps the next time you want to give a polite answer to a question, Ryan. And that's Ask a Teacher. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. I'm Jill Robbins. Our story this week is Quiche. It was written by Jack London. Here is Shep O'Neill to tell you the story. Kish lived at the edge of the Polar Sea. He had seen 13 suns in the Eskimo way of keeping time. Among the Eskimos, the sun each winter leaves the land in darkness. And the next year, a new sun returns, so it might be 
warm again. The father of Kish had been a brave man, but he had died hunting for food. Kish was his only son. Kish lived alone with his mother, Ikiga. One night, the village council met in the big igloo of Kloshkwan, the chief. Kish was there with the others. He listened, then waited for silence. He said, It is true that you give us some meat, but it is often old and tough meat and has many bones. The hunters were surprised. This was a child speaking against them, a child talking like a grown man. Kish said, My father, Bok, was a great hunter. It is said that Bok brought home more meat than any of the two best hunters, and that he divided the meat so that all got an equal share. Nah, nah, the hunters cried. Put the child out. Send him to bed. He should not talk to graybeards this way. Kish waited until the noise stopped. You have a wife, Ugluk, he said, and you speak for her. My mother has no one but me, so I speak. As I say, Bok hunted greatly, but is now dead. It is only fair, then, that my mother, who was his wife, and I, his son, should have meat when the tribe has meat. I, Kish, son of Bok, have spoken. Again there was a great noise in the igloo. The council ordered Kish to bed. It even talked of giving him no food. Kish jumped to his feet. Hear me, he cried. Never shall I speak in the council igloo again. I shall go hunt meat like my father, Bok. There was much laughter when Kish spoke of hunting. The laughter followed Kish as he left the council meeting. The next day, Kish started out for the shore where the land meets the ice. Those who watched saw that he carried his bow and many arrows. Across his shoulder was his father's big hunting spear. Again, there was laughter. One day passed, then a second. On the third day, a great wind blew. There was no sign of Kish. His mother, Ikiga, put burned seal oil on her face to show her sorrow. The women shouted at their men for letting the little boy go. The men made no answer, but got ready to search for the body of Kish. Early next morning, Kish walked into the village. Across his shoulders was fresh meat. Go, you men, with dogs and sleds. Follow my footsteps. Travel for a day, he said. There is much meat on the ice. A she-bear and her two cubs. His mother was very happy. Kish, trying to be a man, said to her, Come, Ikiga, let us eat, and after that I shall sleep, for I am tired. There was much talk after Kish went to his igloo. The killing of a bear was dangerous, but it was three times more dangerous to kill a mother bear with cubs. The men did not believe Kish had done so, but the women pointed to the fresh meat. At last, the men agreed to go for the meat that was left, but they were not very happy. One said that even if Kish had killed the bear, 
he probably had not cut the meat into pieces. But when the men arrived, they found that Kish had not only killed the bear, but had also cut it into pieces, just like a grown hunter. So began the mystery of Kish. On his next trip, he killed a young bear. And on the following trip, a large male bear and its mate. Then there was talk of magic and witchcraft in the village. He hunts with evil spirits, said one. Maybe his father's spirit hunts with him, said another. Kish continued to bring meat to the village. Some people thought he was a great hunter. There was talk of making him chief after old Kloshkwan. They waited, hoping he would come to council meetings, but he never came. I would like to build an igloo, Kish said one day, but I have no time. My job is hunting, so it would be just if the men and women of the village who eat my meat build my igloo. And the igloo was built. It was even bigger than the igloo of the chief, Kloshkwan. One day, the Gluck talked to Kish. It is said that you hunt with evil spirits, and they help you kill the bear. Is not the meat good? Kish answered. Has anyone in the village yet become sick after eating it? How do you know evil spirits are with me? Or do you say it because I am a good hunter? Ugluk had no answer. The council sat up late, talking about Kish and the meat. They decided to spy on him. On Kish's next trip, two young hunters, Bim and Bon, followed him. After five days, they returned. The council met to hear their story. Brothers, Bim said, we followed Kish, and he did not see us. The first day he came to a great bear. Kish shouted at the bear loudly. The bear saw him and became angry. It rose high on its legs and growled, but Kish walked up to it. We saw it, Bon, the other hunter said. The bear began to run toward Kish. Kish ran away, but as he ran, he dropped a little round ball on the ice. The bear stopped and smelled the ball, then ate it. Kish continued to run, dropping more balls on the ice. The bear followed and ate the balls. The council members listened to every word. Bim continued the story. The bear suddenly stood up straight and began to shout in pain. Evil spirits, said Ugluk. I do not know, said Bon. I can tell only what my eyes saw. The bear grew weak. Then it sat down and pulled at its own fur with its sharp claws. Kish watched the bear that whole day. For three more days, Kish continued to watch the bear. It was getting weaker and weaker. Kish moved carefully up to the bear and pushed his father's spear into it. And then, asked Kloshkwan, and then we left. That afternoon, the council talked and talked. When Kish arrived in the village, the council sent a messenger to ask him to come to the meeting. But Kish said he was tired and hungry. He said his igloo was big and could hold many people if the council wanted a meeting. 
Klosh Kwan led the council to the igloo of Kish. Kish was eating, but he welcomed them. Klosh Kwan told Kish that two hunters had seen him kill a bear, and then, in a serious voice to Kish, he said, We want to know how you did it. Did you use magic and witchcraft? Kish looked up and smiled. No, Kloshquan, I am a boy. I know nothing of magic or witchcraft. But I have found an easy way to kill the ice bear. It is headcraft, not witchcraft. And will you tell us, O Kish? Kloshquan asked in a shaking voice. I will tell you. It is very simple. Watch. Kish picked up a thin piece of whalebone. The ends were pointed and sharp as a knife. Kish bent the bone into a circle. Suddenly, he let the bone go, and it became straight with a sharp snap. He picked up a piece of seal meat. So, he said, first make a circle with a sharp, thin piece of whalebone. Put the circle of bone inside some seal meat. Put it in the snow to freeze. The bear eats the ball of meat with the circle of bone inside. When the meat gets inside the bear, the meat gets warm and the bone goes snap. The sharp points make the bear sick. It is easy to kill then. It is simple. Ugluk said, Oh. Kloshquan said, Ah. Each said something in his own way. And all understood. That is the story of Kish, who lived long ago on the edge of the polar sea. Because he used headcraft instead of witchcraft, he rose from the poorest igloo to be the chief in the village. And for all the years that followed, his people were happy. No one cried at night with pains of hunger. You have heard the story, Quiche. It was written by Jack London. Your storyteller was Shep O'Neill. <laughs>